Hi guys, this is Miss Ginter. Uh, welcome back. We are doing another lecture video. So get your uh, headphones, hopefully you already have those in. Um, I don't really want to hear myself talking <laughs> twice. Um, that's enough for me. But uh, we are going to be looking at quite a plethora of information. So we're going to be uh, taking notes on To Kill a Mockingbird. We're also going to be looking at kind of the Roaring Twenties time period. Um, and then we're also going to be looking at some historical context of the Great Depression, things like Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, the Jim Crow laws, and all those uh, good information for contextual things that we need to know regarding this novel that we're going to be reading in class. So you're going to want to make sure that you take notes extra well. Again, there will be some type of quiz or assessment over all of this information. So please feel free to pause the video as you need um, and then make sure again that you are taking notes actively. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, to begin, we're going to kind of look at some elements of fiction. Obviously, fiction means fake. So, To Kill a Mockingbird is fictional. However, um, it could be considered historical nonfiction. So, that means it includes, can include real people, places, things, and events. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, the characters are definitely made up, but they are based on real life people uh, that are author kind of represented characters off of. Um, and it also really hits home for a lot of events that did take place in the 1920s um, and during the Great Depression time period. So it's important when analyzing any type of literature that we know how these elements work together to create an entire story. So um, you guys are going to be getting a handout in class. Uh, it is the historical context of the Great Depression, um, and you're going to be given a handout, uh, page 9, which I can show you, just so you know what I'm talking about, which is the elements of fiction. So everything that I'm going to be talking about is on this reference handout, um, but I still need you to write things down, highlight, underline, circle, make connections. So, um, Okay, let's go back to present view. There we go. Um, so the very first thing that we want to look at, right, is plot. Um, that's the series of events that make up a story. So the different uh, major things that happen. Exposition is, again, that beginning of the story or the background where everything is kind of introduced. The rising action is going to take place before the climax. So again, we've talked about uh, the roller coaster. This is going up the roller coaster. Uh, when we finally get to that top of the roller coaster, right before you know we go over the top of Millennium Force, that's the climax. That is the turning point of the story. It's a very high emotional point for our protagonist, our main character. Uh, and again, I'm not obviously going to give you specifics with this since we haven't read the novel. I don't want to ruin anything, but um, that's kind of what that is. The falling action is when you're, you know, going down from Millennium Force from that highest point. It is the action takes place after the climax and we're going to have a res resolution. Uh, and then obviously resolution is just the end of a story. Now, none of this information should be new. This is definitely all review. Um, it's going to be on your state test. It's going to be on my test. It's going to be on uh, any quiz after this uh, lecture assignment. So again, make sure that you write those down and that you can define each of those accordingly. So with elements of fiction, we also need to look at our conflict and our characters. Again, this is not new information. So conflict is any type of issue between two opposing forces, generally characters. It doesn't have to be, but um, it can be. Uh, other types would be, you know, man versus self or man versus nature. Uh, internal and external conflict are what they sound like. So internal conflict, that's your character struggling within himself, with his conscious, with his own decisions. External, though, is with an outside force. That could be another character, it could be nature, it could be the environment. Uh, if you're driving and there's a snowstorm, if you're in a physical fistfight with someone else, those are external conflicts. Characters are obviously the people in the story that are taking action or doing things. Um, so we have protagonists and antagonists. Protagonist is the main character, and they're going to struggle against the antagonist. The antagonist is kind of like we've talked about, uh, that would be like the, the Joker or the villain, the bad guy. So Batman is the protagonist, and then maybe the Joker would be the antagonist, that conflicting force. If 
finally we get to kind of where our story takes place um, in the point of view. So the setting is the time and place where a story takes place. That could be physical, and we also can show that chronologically. So physical would be the physical environment if your story takes place in a school um, or a specific atmosphere. Chronological is the order that we talk about the setting and events. So in To Kill a Mockingbird, we're going to be looking at a very specific time period. We're going to look at a very specific era, which is going to be the Great Depression era, which is super significant to the contextual understanding of the story. The point of view is just the perspective from which a story is told. We have a narrator, which is the voice that's telling it. So we're going to have a narrator in the story. We're actually going to listen and read this, uh, this To Kill a Mockingbird so that you can kind of hear it and also read along. Uh, that can happen through first person, which is when you're using first person pronouns like I. Third person limited is where you use a third person perspective with third person pronouns and you observe the action as an outside observer which reveals your thoughts, feelings, opinions of only one character. That's why it's called limited. So it's not first person, it is third person, but that is only going to be of one character. So in our story maybe we're just going to know Scout's perspective or we're just going to know Mr. Finch's perspective. If you're omniscient, uh, people usually think of that when we think about uh, religion or God um, or Jesus Christ. Uh, omniscient means all-knowing. And so if you need to remember third-person pe omniscient, again, it's still third-person limited. However, it's not limited anymore. We know everything about every single character. Um, and maybe not everything, but we definitely know more than just about one character. And then finally, a theme is the main idea behind a literary work. Again, I've preached this. It is a message and a story, what we should get from it. The big nugget that we want to take away that we can tell the people on the state test, like, this is what I'm learning from this piece of fiction. So on that worksheet that I said I'm going to give you, um, we're going to have a worksheet that is the context of Harper Lee, that is the author of To Kill a Mockingbird. You will need to know that. Um, and then, you know, we're also going to look at the great depression uh, context. So Harper Lee, uh, her name is Nellie, was actually born in Alabama and she was a really big tomboy but she did like to read and write. And so she went to a grammar uh, and high school with the author Truman Capote who is actually a person, you can look him up, he is a real author, uh, and the character Dill in our story is going to be based on uh, Truman and that was you know a really good friend to her. She later went to Huntington college uh, and she went to the University of Alabama and she got a degree in law. She then went on to New York and got a degree in writing. So she has quite the extensive background of education. Uh, she supported her dream of then being an author or being a writer by being an airline reservation clerk. So she went from grammar and high school to college to learn university of law to writing and then back to airline reservation so that she could actually support herself as a writer. She published To Kill a Mockingbird in the 1960s, um, in 1960 specifically, and that translated in over 30 languages that later won a Pulitzer Prize, which is a very big deal. To Kill a Mockingbird, however, was her only published novel, so she was very successful. Um, and you can see that she passed away in 2016, but uh, when she was alive, she was a one of the top known authors, and that's why To Kill a Mockingbird is still uh, so well known and widely used in schools today. There's a lot of controversy behind it. A lot of people don't like uh, the language. And I will say this as a preface, when we read this novel, they use the N word a lot. Um, I do have the audio reading that uses that word. However, I, I want you to know that, you know, Miss Kinter does not approve of using that language. However, um, it does show you the context of that's really how African American people were treated. And so the language that's presented in the story is very accurate to how people were treated then and unfortunately how people are still treated now. And this issue is so relevant because everything to do with racism and segregation and blacks versus whites or whatever religion or gender, you know, uh, race or authenticity that you are and ethnicity, um, there's a lot of segregation going on. There's a lot of division between groups. And so this issue doesn't really go away. It just, it changes. It masks itself to a new era, to a new year. So we may not live in the Great Depression era anymore, uh, but 
the issues still exist. So we are going to look at the Great Gatsby PowerPoint on the Great Depression. Um, and later we're going to be doing um, the exploring expository writing. You'll either complete that before or after this uh, PowerPoint exercise. And later, uh, we're actually going to be looking at this Plessy versus Ferguson and the Jim Crow laws. So we'll get to that um, a little bit later. I'll just give you brief context on that. Basically, the Plessy versus Ferguson and Jim Crow laws. Um, in January 1st of 1863, Abraham Lincoln had what was called the Emancipation Proclamation. And that was just basically saying we could have freedom for all slaves because there were slave states and free states. Um, and yes, people were not free, they were slaves. Um, so freedom for all slaves residing in the states who were in rebellion against the federal government, which was what was called the Southern states. Um, they thought maybe they would have some victory. So they saw that as a big victory that he issued that the Emancipation Proc Proclamation, but it was never really achieved. So unfortunately, uh, individual states had what they called black codes, and these were denying blacks civil and political rights held by the whites. Uh, because of the bitterness of the Civil War, uh, that remained. And then we got to something awful called the Ku Klux Klan. By June of 1892, Homer Plessy was jailed for sitting in the white section of a railroad car. Um, he was only one-eighth black, meaning he didn't really look African-American. However, he was required to sit in a colored car. In the court case of Homer versus Louisiana, he argued violation of both the 13th and 14th Amendments. However, Ferguson, John Ferguson, was a lawyer and he found Homer guilty. The case then went to the Supreme Court and he was found guilty. Uh, they allowed separate be equal and they strengthened the Jim Crow laws, which allowed states to legally impose punishment for those who crossed the racial barriers, written and non-written. Um, so that's just one example. We looked at a lot of cases uh, before this lecture uh, where people were just really judged by more than just the color of their skin. How, however, that's a major issue in uh, this, this topic, this Great Depression, this book that we're reading. So this is just one example, a really brief overview. Like I said, we'll be looking uh, more in depth at Plessy versus Ferguson and the Jim Crow laws. So don't stress out if you, you know, don't understand this right off the bat. It's, it's a little bit complicated in case you really, uh, unless you really like um, history, but just hang in there and I want you to keep taking notes. So let's go ahead and switch PowerPoints. All right, so this is my favorite thing to lecture on probably in almost the entire world. Um, I used to teach juniors and I would teach the Great Gatsby, but um, I don't get to do that since I teach sophomores now. However, uh, I still use the same PowerPoint because it is the same time period. So you can um, title this still, you know, the 20s or the Roaring 20s part of your PowerPoint notes. So go ahead and write that down. And let's get started. So the Roaring 1920s was known as the most transformative decade in America. Uh, this was the first time when more people lived in cities than on farms and the nation's wealth actually more than doubled. The culture of the 1920s is often remembered for the liberation of women. That means giving them rights to have freedom to do things. Um, and then you know that became known as things like the flappers or distinctive fashion trends and mass consumption. Uh, we'll address a few of these topics in the next few slides. So during the 1920s, it was the best of times. Um, we had a time of great prosperity, economic growth, uh, growth for the urban lifestyles. Like I said, that more people lived in cities than on all the farms. Um, there was more dancing. There was less drinking. They tried to outlaw uh, alcohol. They, they definitely uh, said that it was poisonous. However, it wasn't the best of times for everybody. So during this time, uh, the U.S. beat Germany fresh off of World War I. And the 1920s were an age of dramatic social and political changes. The poor were becoming rich. Um, and really, like, that was just very odd for people. They weren't used to having wealth. Um, like I said, there was prosperity, that nation's wealth doubling, that's called a consumer society. 
People from coast to coast bought the same goods, music, dances, slang. So basically everybody, if you imagine our world today, everybody was on an even playing field. Everyone had money and they had enough of it. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of poverty, uh, at least not for the majority. But many Americans were uncomfortable with this new urban or mass culture. And so unfortunately, it brought more conflict than celebration. And like I said, it was only good for some people. Um, dancing was greater, and that was because they decided that in order to combat the abuse of alcohol, um, that would bring freedom. So really, um, the abuse of alcohol is not a new concept. This was absolutely horrific during the 1920s. Um, the men would be so drunk that they would come home and beat their wives. Um, and so as a result, the wives tried to out lull it or to ban it. Um, and they would say, well, you know what, like, we're just going to go dance and we're going to go party all night so that you can't abuse us. And as unfortunate as that is, that is something that is still a, pre a prevalent issue today through like domestic abuse and domestic violence. But uh, really, the women would um, try to outlaw that. And you can see why, because the men would be so drunk. Um, all they would want is, you know, profanity from their wives. Um, they would want just absolutely ridiculous things and standards, um, and the women just were not going to put up with it anymore. So when we finally got to the World War I winners, uh, after World War I was over, and after the assassination of Ferdinand in 1914, and U.S. beat Germany by 1918, Germany basically had to pay all this money to the United States because um, the Central and Allied powers were at a standstill. Now, America seemed to be in great economic state. The Republicans were in the White House and they won by a landslide. And there seemed to be two types of classes. So on the previous side, slide, uh, you know, I said that everybody kind of was equal. Um, however, there were still classes. There were still the high class and the low class. Now, this was a great economic state as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and then the Republicans were the people that were conservative. Now, that means that they usually gave back money. There was no middle class during this time. And these are the people that really wanted to help. So obviously, if you're really high class, you have all the wealth, you have all the money. Uh, you don't really want to help anybody because you're happy by yourself. Low class, you are too poor to help anybody. You don't have enough resources to do anything. And so really we're looking at that Republicans versus Democrats and the high and low class because no low class um, or no middle class, you know, right above that low class existed. And I mentioned this on the first slide, but we have the new woman and this was known as the flapper. It was a symbol for women in that time period and they were stereotyped as, you know, that bob hairstyle. It's real short by the you know, by the jawline. They wore very short skirts. They drank heavenly, heavily. They smoked. They said unladylike things. There was a lot more sexually experienced uh, issues than previous generations. And this brought about a lot of really, you know, great strides for women. So women started having better white collared job opportunities. So things like in the city, big deals, um, very significant jobs. And they also had new birth control methods. So they started having fewer children. Now, the evolution of women prior to this was very long skirts. Um, the women would stay at home. They would do housework. They weren't really allowed to work. Um, and also, usually, they just wore, like I said, long skirts or pants. So anything short was just seen as absurd. Um, mortality was changing, however, and becoming more compromised. And so the stigma became revised. Women became more independent. They got jobs and paychecks. And this was the first time that there would be two incomes in a household, which is what we have today. So, you know, prior to the Great Depression in the 1920s, uh, it was not likely that women or even myself, people like myself that are women, um, would not work in you know, a school, you would not work in a hospital, you wouldn't work at all, except for at your home, your job was to, you know, uh, do laundry, dishes, take care of the children, have children. So when I talked about the white collar jobs, you know, those are the types of jobs they had business, they were away from the farms, they were in the cities, they had secretary jobs, very high status. Um, and it was also, like I said before, there was birth control. And so, you know, I remember my grandma uh, talking about this birth control and how when it first came out, you know, everybody around her, her parents thought it was of the devil. It was just this awful thing. Um, and people really didn't realize the 
benefit that that could have for women because if they were on birth control they were less likely to conceive more children and so if they didn't have more children then they could go in the workforce they could be more independent they could make a name for themselves and not feel so dependent on a male besides women uh, having evolutionary changes, however, there were also brand new concepts. And so we uh, had the birth of entertainment uh, to learn about new things worldwide. Prior to this, there were quite a few things that were going on. Um, so we finally had uh, clothes that were now, you know, just go and buy them mainstream. Prior to this, they were tailored to your body. You know, we had seamstresses seam um, and people that would make things custom for you that was you know today we see that as a, a specialty you know if my boyfriend uh when we get married has to get his suit or his tux uh you know altered that, that that's a specialty that costs extra money but back then that was how you got clothes everything was custom my grandma like i said made um plenty of clothing for my mom and her sister growing up that was that was the thing you didn't really go buy clothes um, but now they could go and buy things mainstream uh, money meant more movies and cars and so cars produced jobs for like mechanics and gas stations and people to work on the cars uh, people to produce you know the gasoline it also invented uh, you know, electric refrigerators, we had the radio. So this was within a few years, there were five main radio networks. Uh, like I said, there was higher movie attendance because people could afford to go to the movies, more cars on the road. Like I said, the services uh, also produced, you know, like hotels and motels because people are driving. Uh, the ready wear clothes. And then one of the really interesting things that happened was called credit. Now, if a lot of you have a credit card or you know of a credit card you know the purpose there's a credit card and then there's a debit card now credit back in the great depression era um, this was a tab that you would have at a store so let's say that you go to kroger's and you would say okay um, i'm getting paid next week so just put it on my tab credit and i'll be in next week to pay it um, and obviously that really was a major significant issue that led to the Great Depression because, you know, uh, little little Johnny uh, has a job and he just racked up, you know, $150 on his tab, but then next week rolls around and he loses his job and he can't go back in and pay that, but he already took all this stuff home. So literally, guys, that would be like if you went into Kroger and you're like, okay, I'll be back uh, in two weeks to pay my $150 for groceries, and then you just I mean, you take the food home and then you never go back and pay it. So that was clearly a major flaw in this era. People had a little bit too, too much trust in people around them. Finally, we have uh, the jazz age. And this was the time, like I said, when people just wanted to go party. All the younger generation wanted to do was dance. Now, uh, the older generation saw this style of music and dance as vulgar and moral disasters. Uh, you know, kind of uh, like homecoming. Uh, so I'm just kidding. I have not witnessed all of the homecomings, but I've witnessed quite a few and I don't ever want to go back. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I can't really tell you. Uh, sometimes I, you know, have to show you those things. However, um, this jazz age, you know, dance was not like it is today. I think that today, and I've said this before, I'm a dancer. I led uh, a dance, two, two dance groups actually, um, a dance group that I formed in college. It was called Movements from the Heart. And then when I graduated, I led one called Aesthetic Host Joy. Um, I still dance to this day. My boyfriend and I will perform for churches and local events. However, um, I bring that up to say that dance is not like it was today, right? right? Today we have Dancing with the Stars. Uh, we have ballroom, we have, uh, so you think you can dance all of these shows where dance is really like praise people know that it is this awesome aesthetic art however back then like i said people really viewed it as horrific the dancing wasn't always that bad that they were doing um, it wasn't like the inappropriate grinding that you see at homecoming or doing things that you should not be doing um, however i can really relate to this because when i was in college um, i remember i was a freshman and the provost of the school heard me say that I danced. Uh, he said, what, you can't go to this school and dance? And I was like, 
well, watch me. <laughs> like, I will gladly show you that my dance is not inappropriate. Um, I've danced since I was three years old. Um, and I, you know, made a vow and I felt like God wanted me to create this dance team at the school. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to say that I, I did. I created a team and led it for three to five years. Um, it was very, very monumental for my school. We got to perform in front of something called the Festival of Carols in front of thousands of people um, at, at the college that I went to. And it was just a great deal. But, you know, I had to prove that the dance wasn't what people thought that it was, at least in that context. The people of this jazz age had to do the same thing. All they wanted to do was dance. But like I said, their reason for wanting to dance uh, mainly was because the women were being abused by the men. And so they're like, no, we're just going to go party. We're just going to go have fun because we don't want to be bossed around by our husbands. Now that kind of leads to the next slide, which is called prohibition. Here's a slide uh, that illustrates that point. Help me to keep him pure. Please vote against the sale of liquors. Uh, this prohibition means the ban of alcohol. People, mainly women, thought that booze, like I said, was the root to all evil. And it was the answer, if they were able to prohibit that, the domestic violence solver. They thought, okay, we're just going to prohibit it. Then our husbands won't be drunk. They won't beat us. They won't abuse us. While the movement did work for a little bit, um, many believe that it created a very corrupt America. And it led to something called uh, bootleggers. Now, this actually, this idea of prohibition started in Hillsboro, which is in Ohio. Um, if men went to the bars, then basically the women wouldn't sleep with them. So they said, nope, if you're going to go get drunk and you're going to come back and be a jerk, then sorry, no sex for you, um, which sounds really provocative. Uh, but during this time period, the, the women weren't trying to be jerks at all, but I don't think that you want to be abused by someone and then just be used by them. Um, and so the bootleggers would be the people would actually put alcohol in their boots. So, for example, people who sneak flasks uh, into their prom suits or into their shoes. Uh, I know that you know that many people can sneak things however they want to, um, but these bootleggers would put the alcohol in their boots. And so when they did that, uh, it really didn't solve the issue of alcohol. It kind of made it worse. It's like the kid that you tell, hey, don't touch that spot because it's going to hurt, and then, you know, if they touch it anyways, and they're like, oh, it hurt. Um, or, you know, if you tell someone, well, you can't jump off that building, they're going to say, watch me, I'm going to jump off that building, and they do it anyways. So it created a really reckless society. Now, prohibition, here's another sign, says lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. By 1919, they had the ratification of the 18th Amendment, and so people could not sell any alcohol beverages that had more than 0 0.05 alcohol in it. Uh, this evidently led to the liquor trade to an underground operation called things like speakeasies. That became the normal meeting place, and that led to other awful demonized things such as organized crime that's where we talk about like al capone um and really it, it obviously did not work um so people ended up getting really mad uh that was like i said that 1919 date was the ratification of the 18th amendment so rest in peace to prohibition uh prohibition did not work and so they kind of uh, revoked that revoked that uh, law by March 22nd of 1933. And uh, like I said, back on this slide, the speakeasies were kind of like a back bar. So you had a password to get in, or you'd have to knock a certain way, or have a specific handshake um, to get in, and you could safely and easily drink. Uh, however, it was still illegal. And like I said, that really led to organized crime. So things like the mob, Al Capone, mafia, really, really awful things happening during the 1920s. After the prohibition was revoked, we get to something called Black Tuesday. Now, this is an actual headline from the newspaper, and the headline is from that following Friday. So, like, you know, Friday, and then you have Saturday, Sunday, Monday, that coming Tuesday. The greatest crash in Wall Street's history, which was the uh, panic selling overwhelms the market. Now, let's kind of talk about what this is. So Black Tuesday, the stock market crashed in October of 1929. And let's talk about what does that mean? So basically, Black Tuesday, the, the market or the stock market crashed in different ways. Um, it actually crashed, 
crashed the previous Thursday, so this was October 24th. It fully crashed by Tuesday, October 29th. When money runs out, it dips really low and people stop buying and then they back out of things like investments. The investors, those are the rich people, they basically made some calls Thursday and Friday and they said, you know, we need to put put uh, into the stock market. We need money put into the stock market. However, by Tuesday, they hit rock bottom and they bottomed out. Now, if you remember when I talked about all of those tabs um, or credits in the store, this would be, you know, all those people that had said, hey, I'm going to get paid on this day. I'm going to come back. I'm going to give my money. Um, they weren't able to, to do that. <laughs> and so now you have all these rich people who are like, oh my gosh, like the, the, there's no more money. Like it, it's gone and people are bought you know, dipping low and people stop buying things and they're backing out. So people who have investments um, or stocks on like, you know, today it'd be like Apple or um, Android and different companies that are really high, Packard. And so by Tuesday it hit rock bottom and there was virtually no, no money. Now this chart's really complicated, um, but basically these numbers the, the ones that say change, right? So October 28th, negative 38%, October 29th, negative 30%, negative 12, negative 11. Those numbers are supposed, just to give you an idea, supposed to be between negative one and negative five. Okay, obviously negative 11 to negative 38 is much greater than negative one to negative five. And so um, obviously this is, this is horrific. Uh, this is by the do do the Dow Jones Industrial Average on Black Monday and Black Tuesday, um, but the main event is just known as Black Tuesday. Now here's the picture of all the people trying to get their money out of the bank, but the banks couldn't meet the demand and so the people couldn't get their money. Now practically speaking, let's kind of talk about this. So let's say that um, I put my money into bank, which, which I currently do. <laughs> um, and some people actually, to tell you the truth, still don't put their money in the bank because of the Great Depression. It just really scarred them. Um, people like that hide their money in books or shelves or under their mattresses. But so let's say that um, I just went and put like $5,000 in the bank over the past five years. Uh, if I went to get my money during this time period, the bank's going to look at me and they're like, sorry, I don't have any of your money. And so that, that's what happened to every single person that had money in the bank. They went to get their money. And, you know, banks only hold a certain amount of money. I think you guys probably know that. But banks only hold certain amounts. They don't have, you know, all the money in the world. There's a cap. But people went to get their money and their money is gone. It, it, you're never getting it back. It's, you know, the people at the store that had credit tabs, they can't pay that money back. The stores aren't going to get that money. And so every single store is going to go under. Uh, you're going to go under because all your money that you saved in the bank, which was supposed to get a uh, interest, which is kind of where you get money because you're keeping your money in the bank, very, very slow. It's like so many cents every like month. Um, but no, like it, it's literally gone. So all of your hard-earned money, let's say that you've been saving for college, $50,000 in the bank, gone, poof. Like you are never getting it back. The people are not going to give it back because nobody has any money. So, unfortunately, this idea of the American dream became just that. It was just a dream. This is a real picture. It says world's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way. But all these people, they're standing in line for a food pantry because they can't afford food. And so people went from the greatest of times uh, to the worst desperation that they had ever seen. Uh, like I said, those finances, they went to crap. People wanted to get their money, but they couldn't. Um, and when the bank ran out and closed, then nobody has money. And so, like I said, people still will hoard money to this day because they're so scarred from this event. Uh, the banks couldn't be trusted. People lost everything. Jobs led to stores going under. They couldn't pay tabs. Everything went off a cliff. Once you have a standard of living, something like, you know, the quote unquote American dream, it's hard to change how you live if you're used to living wealthy all the time, which we've talked about, and then all of a sudden you hit bankruptcy and your poverty. You, you don't know how to live. Um, on this sign, people are lined up to go to the soup kitchen, go to the food pantry. They fell off the cliff of success, and what they always wished for, what they always wanted, became just a dream.
So when we read To Kill a Mockingbird in this class, I really hope that you take it seriously that these are things that happen to real people and it's something that can certainly happen again. We need to be aware of things like that. We need to be aware of big issues. So beyond just racial segregation and discrimination that we're going to look at, this also happened in an era of the Great Depression. And I hope that that gives you a really good contextual understanding. Of course, I make sure that you took all of those notes. You need to make sure that you wrote things down. There will be a thorough quiz on this. If at any point you have any further questions, and like I said, we're going to talk so much more about this. This is just, you know, I know this is kind of lengthy, but this is just a brief over overview, guys. This is such a complicated issue, but it's one that's extremely important for you to understand. So if you have any questions after you've taken your notes, feel free to email me or come see me or reach out to me, okay? So make sure that you finish this. Again, there is going to be um, a review and a quiz. So I hope that you guys have a great day.